Let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have an important topic with a splendid guest, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. You'll notice the Future Trends Forum has been doing more and more sessions on what the climate crisis might mean for the future of higher education. We've been exploring this from different angles, and it's actually the subject of my forthcoming book. Now, if you would like to dive in and learn more, please just contact me, and uh, we have more guests coming up the pipe. Now, for today, we're going to focus on one particular aspect of the climate crisis in academia, which is looking at the physical campus, at the buildings, the grounds, the planning cycles of colleges and universities. In order to help elucidate this and to explore it, we have a wonderful, wonderful expert. Michael Higgins is an architect, a campus planner, a terrific networker, a deep thinker with a huge amount of expertise, a lot of great thinking on this subject. He's just my go-to person on earth for what happens to campuses in higher education. And I feel immensely privileged to be able to welcome him to be this week's guest. So without any further ado, I will bring him up on stage. Hello, Michael. Hi, Brian. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you. Where are you today? I am in Guilford, Connecticut. Ah, I see. I see. And it's July. Does that mean uh, it's pretty warm? It's pretty warm, but it's not Midwestern warm like I'm ah, used to. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I can hear that. I can hear that. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm delighted you can join us. You know, Michael, you've, you've been um, a participant in the forum for some time, and you know that we like to ask people to introduce themselves. Sure by speaking about what they're working on for the next year. But you somehow, somehow claim to be kind of retired. Um, <laughs> so if, if that bizarre rumor is actually true, <laughs> let me ask you this. What are you going to be thinking about for the next year in terms of higher ed? What are the major topics and themes that are really uppermost in your mind? Yeah. Well, uppermost is the response of campuses to climate change. Uh, in other words, the institution's response and how it's expressed in the physical campus. Mm. That's that's the number one topic. Um, for many years, I've been writing uh, Campus Matters uh, blog, and that started as an exploration of the implications of digital transformation on the physical campus. In other words, what did it mean when more and more of the activity and we'll say content of the institution moved online mm -hmm. and how, how was that beginning to show up and then you know in march of uh, what was it <laughs> 2020 yes. everything transformed almost instantly um and so uh, that activity is in the rear view mirror and now what i'm looking forward to or looking to is the uh, changes that are beginning to take place in terms of the physical campus in response to climate change. Well, that's appropriate because that is the topic of our discussion today. Uh, friends, if, if you're new to the forum, I'm going to ask Michael a couple of questions to just start him you know, riffing on this subject. But the forum is here for you. So as we start talking, please start thinking about the questions you'd like to put to our guest. And again, the very bottom of the screen, there's the raised hand button if you want to ask out loud and the question mark if you like to type in your question. I guess, Michael, I, I have so many, so many questions to begin with, but, but if, if, if we think about higher ed as a whole, what are, the, what are the biggest threats that climate change poses to a physical bricks and mortar campus? Well, it very much depends on where you are. Mm -hmm. This is one of those things where location does matter. Uh, for those institutions that are near the uh, coast and uh, places that are affected by uh, sea level rise, they're already beginning to uh, respond by raising floor levels mm -hmm. um, and uh, beginning to think about uh, storm surges. Mm -hmm. um, in other parts of the country, issues of water wind up being fairly important. Uh, the ability to actually maintain the presence of the campus in uh, the way that it's come to be uh, uh, seen. And across the board, uh, there are concerns 
uh, about energy, uh, the cost of energy. And for those who are beginning to take that complex of issues more seriously, they're moving as um, in a, to varying degrees in responding to the climate crisis by reducing their carbon footprints. If, if I could press on a couple of these. Sure. First, when you in your second point, when you mentioned water, I assume you're referring to right. scarcity. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. first we see, yeah, I intended to mention scarcity, but there are certainly some campuses that have had to adapt to increase flooding right. uh, inland campuses. Uh, an example of that would be uh, Iowa University that sits on two sides of a river and they've had at least one fairly disastrous flood within the last many years. And they've prepared for that by building uh, various mitigation uh, measures. Uh, their, their risk is one that they can assess uh, fairly directly. Some other places are still to discover exactly what their physical, their physical risks are. I see. And and all of that uh, response fits into the category that's called resilience. In other mm -hmm. words, the ability to continue on even in the face of uh, challenges of uh, of weather, uh, climate, and resources. So, if your campus is hammered by storm surges, or if your campus dries out so that you can no longer provision enough water for your foliage or your humans. Uh, how do you continue? Um, well, you know that uh, I think I think you and others have speculated that that leads to a question of migration. And uh, in my conversations over the last uh, six months, I've I've picked up at least one example of where that where people have begun to talk about that, but not seriously. Hmm. Um, because because it's such a dramatic uh, it's such a dramatic question for people to begin to consider that uh, that sort of uh, that sort of effort. It is it is. I I, I went to the uh, University of Michigan starting in the late 1980s, and they had tried to migrate the uh, campus about 10 miles um, in the 1960s and 70s, yeah. and yeah. did about half of it, and then gave up basically. Right. And that uh, and that still scarred the uh, university at the time, and that's just a, a little a little shift. Right. Um, I guess the the, the an, another question to ask is is to what extent do you see the physical campus being vulnerable to the secondary impacts of climate change? And, and that is thinking about, for example, changes in animal uh, life, uh, flora uh, as well as fauna, uh, as animals, diseases, plants have to move. Uh, as heating changes local climates, but also knock-on effects such as economic changes, you know, an area that depends heavily on agriculture, losing, um, uh, losing money as a result of that. Um, but how, well, how else should we expect campuses to be, well, endangered by this? Well, the lens that I look through is the changes that uh, take place on the physical campus. In other words, what does it become? And by virtue of a whole uh, series of forces, digital transformation, as well as uh, uh, resource limitations, I see campuses becoming more focused and uh, uh, potentially smaller while still serving the larger, the, the populations that they, uh, that they serve. Uh, but that is, of course, a bending of a curve that has been uh, rising. Uh, significantly for quite some for quite some time. Um, I don't see can I, I guess, Brian, to answer your question, let me come at it a little bit different way. I see that what campuses are is a type of mm, we'll call it small city to put a simple label on it. In other words, there are places where people work, where people leave, uh, live where they recreate, they, uh, uh, they attend a variety of functions. It is a, it is a place that um, can be a model for how it is possible to live on a planet different than the one that anybody on this call mm -hmm. 
grew up on. Yes. Because that's the realization that's beginning to come to campus planners and others at the institutions. Not that anybody has any uh, magic answers to this, but the challenge of the next generation will be to adapt these campuses for that changing environment and all the different aspects of it that uh, that the different vectors that we could describe that are impacting. And the metaphor that I've used is it will be like rebuilding that ship at sea. Wow. Wow. That's a great metaphor and, a, and also a great way to frame this. Uh, my friend Bill McKibben has a book called uh, Earth. It's spelled E-A-A-R-T-H. <laughs> it's a way of getting us to think about Earth being, being that different. I, I had another question I wanted to pose to you, Michael, but we have a, a actually a better way of asking that question that just came in from uh, one of our one of our participants. And I'll put this on the stage so you can all see it. Um, this is um, from uh, Charles Finley uh, at Northeastern, who says, "A digital transformation requires energy to support the technology. What do campuses do to get off the fossil fuel grid? Develop their own off-grid power source, or what?" Great question, Charles. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that question. Uh, the short answer is yes, that's exactly what happens. Uh, there are many campuses. Well, let me rephrase that. There are some campuses that are, in effect, already off the grid. Hmm. Uh, um, the, the best example, the best uh, publicized and documented example of that is Arizona State University. Uh, they have uh, gone extensively into solar, some wind, but uh, they, they use no electricity that is uh, generated by uh, fossil fuels. Those are big shifts. Uh, some institutions are able to make those kinds of moves, but those are the, exactly the kind of steps, whether wholesale or incrementally, that are included within what are known as climate action plans that uh, that several institutions have. And those are documented at best. The best single source to see where your campus is, is the uh, website I put in the chat, which is the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Ed. Um, and they, if your institution is in there, you're going to be able to see the specific steps that your institution is taking. If your institution isn't there, uh, there you might wish to ask questions about why your institution is not there. Yes. Um, so, so Charles, that the simple answer to the question is yes. That's exactly what folks are doing. And it's happening at a small scale or at a large scale. Um, and it's happening in uh, many places across the country. But as I've scanned the progress, it's not happening rapidly enough, nor is it happening uh, every place. Um, so first of all, if you're, if you're new to the Future Trends Forum, this is an example of a text question. And it's also an example of a great text question and a great, great guest answer. Um, so if you'd like to follow suit, please uh, hit that uh, Q&A box. Um, I, I do have one question, if I, if I could just follow on, on, on that, Michael, which is, uh, to what extent are you seeing campuses start uh, offshoring or outsourcing their power in different ways? Uh, I, I'm thinking, for example, about uh, Berea College in Kentucky, which just bought or help take over two different uh, hydropower facilities right. off campus but nearby right. Right. so instead of sourcing from coal they're sourcing from hydro right uh, are you the, seeing more of that there there are many steps like that the arizona state example i i used uh is uh is an example that uh, that solar is not coming from is not coming from the campus um, at the same time that uh, that solar is within the economic envelope of the institution, there's no question about that. 
that doesn't really it it doesn't change the physical campus except to the extent that every rooftop surface that's available for solar locally um, is beginning to be exploited for that purpose, mm. and and that's beginning to happen on on many campuses as new buildings mm. are built. Uh, at the uh, if I could add to that. There's also the development of what's known as living buildings. Those are buildings that produce more energy, store more water than they use, et cetera. In other words, they're, we can think of those buildings as almost being organic entities in the sense that they're designed in order to um, uh, function to support the people who use that building in a way that uh, does not require them to be uh, connected uh, to the grid in the way that we think of normal normal buildings as being plugged in, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, friends, I think you're starting to hear the, the outline of what the campus might look like in, in this new world. Uh, I just shared the uh, Association for Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education link. I just repeated uh, Michael's link to that in the chat. And uh, Ed Webb just uh, shared um, a story about his campus, Dickinson College, uh, which uh, they have a solar project which just won a, a Global Sustainability Award. Uh, so, uh, Ed, if you want to say more about that, please, please feel free. Um, uh, I just personally, I think Dickinson does, does great work for that. But before I can say anything more, we have more questions coming in. So let me just bring them up as well. Um, we have uh, from my good friend, uh, Mark Rush, uh, we have this question. Like it or not, should campuses not look to operate more locally and support commuters? That would decrease the need for dorms, etc. This is radical, but radical measures are necessary. Well, <laughs> radical is in the eye of the beholder, uh, isn't it? Uh, and so, yes, I believe that campuses need to adapt in the way that's uh, suggested by that comment. In particular, if we, I'm going to go a little bit technical here, just so we've got some some uh, uh, structure to grab onto and what it means to go to carbon neutral. In other words, reduce the footprint of the campus to zero. There are three categories that uh, carbon impacts are counted in. The first is combustion on site. Coal powered fire plant, um, um, power plant would be a typical example. The second is off site emissions. That would be, for example, purchase, purchased electricity that's uh, perhaps even generated by natural gas. So we've got categories one and two, and a lot of institutions are driving to take that categories one and two to uh, to zero. And ASU, as I indicated, has already done that. And there are others who have done it as well on a, on a smaller scale. Category three is where we get into the commuting mm. and air travel consequences of the institution's very existence. And that's where some really innovative work needs to be done to balance that uh, commuting with living on campus. Um, and at the same time, recognize that the way in which campuses will be used in the future is a lot more episodic and um, transitory than we may have thought about it in the past. And that's a consequence of the realization that we don't have to come to the campus every day, if at all. And we learned a lot about that from the past two years. We sure did. Uh, that's a, thank you, that's a great answer. And uh, Mark had an actual follow-up on that. So I wanna just flash this on the screen so that we can carry this on, where he takes this in one particular direction. Um, this would clearly counteract diversity efforts, but the cost of recruitment and air travel generally are important considerations for greening, no? There's, there's a lot of complexity mm -hmm. to, to being able to do that. 
Um, and so somebody who's able to go to zero carbon on campus uh, in categories one, two, and three, and uh, uh, that does not mean that they do no air travel. That does not mean that they don't invest in any use of fossil fuels. It's just that they do it in such a way that, A, it's small to begin with and thoughtful as opposed to unthoughtful, which is frankly the way that we've been using the resources that we have, but, but doing it in a strategic way and offsetting that as appropriate with other actions. Thank you. This this is definitely a sphere of great complexity, um, and, and Mark has just taken us through one vector of that very clearly. Mm -hmm. We have we have more questions coming up, and I want to give people a chance. Um, and this is one from um, uh, Bart Trudeau, uh, the president of Trudeau Associates, and uh, he asks, "Does Michael have any suggestions on how to evangelize students? We recently planned a net zero ready student residence." And the residents are complaining about cooling set points of a minimum 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. Well, in my experience, the folks who need the evangelism are members of boards of directors and the management uh, of uh, universities. But I appreciate at the user level the the issues of uh, set points and thermostats and uh, air conditioning and all of that, those are important things. Uh, the steps that I have seen that have been effective specifically with respect to students is that the students are allowed to self-select for those environments. And therefore they have in a sense committed to understanding what they're, what they're getting into in that particular uh, facility. Mm, mm. Hope that's uh, helpful, Mark, but it's, uh, you know, if somebody does not like the temperature at any one point, uh, those, are, those are complaints that every architect and engineer who ever practiced is very familiar with those and, and they need to be, and they need to be responded to. Um, and it may well be that uh, that the temperature setting in a particular place needs to be uh, uh, tweaked down. Uh, but that doesn't mean that that has an environmental consequence if it's an electric system that or a ground source heat pump or mm -hmm. other non-polluting, non-carbon generating system uh, is uh, using. Uh, in the in the chat, uh, there was an observation. Uh, there was a great story from a British university where the bursar offered to lower the heat in dorms to meet the students' green demands. Uh, <laughs> so, Bart, that's that's a different take on on, on your question there. Um, we have a, a a question that spins off of this, um, and that comes from a uh, good friend, Joe Murphy. And I want to bring him on stage to ask this question, because this is a good one here. Uh, hello, Joe. Hi, Brian. How are you? Hi, Good. Good. Right. So, I was starting to wonder about some of these particular your, your Your voice is a little quiet. Um, I don't know if your mic is low or not. Is, is that better? Uh, a little bit. Only a little. Hmm. Mark, uh, Michael, can you hear him okay? I can. Let's try it. Okay. Uh, Ah, there it is. Is that better? Gotcha. Whoa! Ah, Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait till everybody turns the volume up, and then I'll fix my mic. That's right. That's right. Um, so, as you were talking about the way that different buildings might be have different statuses up to the point of being more organic, it started to make me think about some of the curricular and logistic implications of that that right. particularly if we're talking about getting to the stage where this building will have full water and this building will have restricted water you know we're already at my campus participating in an energy response plan where uh, right. on particularly hot days the right. thermostats all go up to uh, right. reduce uh, you know not not to not to reduce carbon use but to reduce energy costs and strain on the grid so I found myself wondering, you know, could, should we be thinking about a world in which uh, maybe some programs only exist uh, during the summer when we've got lots of abundant solar power to 
to power them or some spaces that are mostly used at night instead of during the day when it's more expensive to cool them or and i'm just wondering if there's if there's work going on that's addressing the idea that uh, we might need to change either our daily or yearly schedules um, to, to make these kind of changes work well? I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, and let me come at it from the practical pieces that I see, and let's we'll come back to what the, the future may hold with respect to that. Um, the one place where there is some motion that is related to this is in the uh, uh, scheduling of classrooms, specifically recognizing the classes are not being, the spaces are not being used the way that they were. And, and um, it's not possible yet, but folks are beginning to talk about being able to schedule classroom seats the same way that you schedule an airplane uh, seat. Wow. Well, and and of course, different different rooms have different characteristics depending on how what's being uh, taught, what's being discussed, what the size of the classroom is, et cetera, et cetera. So you can begin to describe, uh, think about that as being a series of alternatives that are available in order to customize the response or the support for the. Uh, for the, uh, the class that's being taught. Um, with respect to the uh, uh, time of day and all the rest of that, in many parts of the country right now, electricity in particular is priced by time of day. And I think that's what you're, uh, it may be related to what uh, related, yeah. in Kenyan is experiencing. And uh, for what it's worth, that has a carbon benefit when you don't mm -hmm. turn things on, right? Uh, the other thing that's happening um, uh, at a technical level with respect to those kinds of questions is beginning to uh, store energy in different ways. Uh, in tanks of water, in tanks of sand, uh -huh. uh, using ground source heat pumps for uh -huh. seasonal and daily storage. In other words, water going in and out of the ground, depending on the time of day uh, and the cost of being able to do that. All of that fine tuning the, uh, the machine to respond to the needs. But overarching that, and then I'll, my speculation will stop at this point in response to your wonderful question. I'll work on this one for a while. But the, but the idea, the thing is that to begin to think more flexibly about the way we use uh, facilities and begin to modify, as you suggest, the, the schedules. Um, this becomes very difficult just uh, uh, the scheduling is a huge task to begin with, right? And modifying it for the number of people that you have to have to get together is is also uh, very difficult. But I think there's movement movement in that direction, um, and certainly the ability to not use some facilities during some parts of the year. Uh, is is certainly a way to begin to respond to that. I'll I'll be thinking about your question for a long time. Okay. Great. Well, thanks. Yeah, me too. Great question, Joe. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, and that was one of those moments in the future transform where every person on stage has a beard. Uh, I just wanted to recommend <laughs> that and and, and that. Um, we have uh, uh, friends. We have. Uh, uh, lots of room for your questions and comments. So if you're just joining us, um, we have the wonderful Michael Higgins. Uh, and as you can hear, we're exploring the different ways that campuses can respond to the different challenges posed by the climate crisis. Uh, we had a, a wonderful question that came up from uh, our great Madison, Wisconsin uh, connection, John Hollenbeck. Uh, he actually put two questions up. And let me give you the first one because it, it builds on what we were just talking about. Uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison is constantly building and expanding to accommodate the four-year degree in grad students. When do we alter curriculum and degrees to make more efficient use of existing facilities? 
I think you were just speaking to that um, in, in your response to Joe. Right. But, but this isn't quite the same question. Could you put that back up again, of Brian? Of course. Thanks. Well, many people are modifying their curriculum uh, to, well, many people are beginning to modify their curriculum. Uh, the more efficient use is something that's coming very hard. It's, it's more difficult, John, as you would appreciate at large institutions. Uh, they move in large blocks. They behave uh, as aircraft carriers do. Uh, they continue to move in the direction that they're moving for quite some time. And, and that has its strengths in terms of stability, but it has its weaknesses in terms of being able to respond. The place where that's happening is college by college and, and uh, uh, course by course and uh, instructor by instructor where things can be a lot more fluid. Uh, and I think you would, if you look around at UW-Madison, you'd find some colleges or some units uh, and some programs are behaving more nimbly than, than others. And Brian, was there then a second question? Um, yeah, there, there was, um, which has to do with um, a, a very particular aspect of this, which is uh, a very American aspect, which is sports. Could intercollegiate sports be canceled as a public statement of carbon neutrality? Well, uh, let me come at that from uh, from a different direction, John. Um, uh, recognizing that there there's a lot of uh, complications on related to that question. I was once asked the question. So if you were going to design a new university today mm -hmm. and you would start from a bare piece of ground and begin to build that up, what would you put? Where would it be? Well, I started with a library. That's my thought experiment on that, uh, because the librarian has uh, the library has a librarian and the librarian is the key. Uh, to to so much. But the last thing I would do would be to build any sports facilities because they don't add to that core that core mission. Um, I don't know that one cancels uh, sports events as a function of uh, achieving carbon neutrality, but those institutions who are taking carbon neutrality seriously, certainly include the sports activities within their problem set. And as a result, they address those energy costs, those environmental impacts as well. And so I think that's the way to get to the kind of question that or the, the, the way to think about that particular question in a physical uh, context. Well, John, thank you as always for a great uh, even puckish question and Michael the the chat box just blew up on this you know people just, <laughs> really <laughs> uh, you know uh, uh, you know um, Charles Roberts offered the incredibly acidic line if we eliminated intercollegiate sports it would make things overall more efficient because of the small colleges that would close without them um, you know there um, but but I thank you John and thank you Michael for that uh, very very nuanced and sensitive uh, response. We have a comment that came in from Howard Seth Wertheimer, who just had to go, but I wanted to make sure we could hear this. Uh, in terms of the set point of temperature, he pointed out, humans, students included, have the ability to control their microenvironments to address their own personal consequences. Their own clothing work very well and can have significant impacts on the environment with financial benefits. It was just you know, made me think, Michael, that uh, we could see uh, campuses pushing uh, branded clothing um, uh, for the climate perspective angle, you know, get more hoodies, more sweatshirts, that kind of thing. Um, and, well, but we let, me, have... let me give a shout out to Howard, uh, a longtime friend and colleague from uh, Georgia Tech, and uh, he and others responsible for a living building at uh, at Georgia Tech. And so nice. his his observations are based on uh, personal and practical experience. 
excellent excellent bravo um and then we had two co i can't flash this on the screen right now because this has occurred through a few different chat lines but i just want to put the topic up for your consideration um ed webb and mark rush were asking about this uh what happens to internationalization um ed was asking about study abroad international exchange and so on uh he mentions or i should say brags that he spent last year directing a study abroad program in italy we all hate him very cordially now uh, <laughs> but he said virtual exchanges can substitute only up to a point yeah and you know, i'm like what, what do you think about this uh, should we you know push for fewer international exchanges but longer term or, or what do you think i think that uh zero carbon campus doesn't mean you're not using any carbon uh, it does mean that it's done in a thoughtful way so that's the overarching principle the question then is what choices does an institution make uh, at its local uh, place to be able to do that so i certainly agree that virtuality is not uh, the be-all end-all uh, that there is something important about people sharing space and time that's why I labeled my blog Campus Matters because of exactly that phenomenon, whether that's in Italy or Tierra del Fuego or Madison, Wisconsin, the contact between people is important. The reason why I focus on the campus is so that, and its future is so that it will actually be there in the future. Um, I think we need to, in general, then, to conclude that thought, I think we need to be more intentional about that, those investments uh, in uh, travel in particular, and more careful uh, in them, rather than assuming that it's okay. In other words, asking the question, is this really what needs to be done? And certainly you can't experience Italy by being anywhere else but Italy. No, or Chair del Fuego. There you go. Uh, doing this more intentionally. Thank you uh, for everyone who brought up that topic. Uh, we have more questions uh, barging in, and there's one from our, uh, our our great friend and wonderful screen capture uh, and thoughtful thinker, uh, Roxanne Riskin, uh, who asks this question. Oops. A number of universities are building satellite campuses in different states and even outside the US in Europe and elsewhere. Have you seen any environmental exemplars in place? Uh, easy answer, Roxanne, is no. Um, I will add that to my uh, add that to my data search. I think there's certainly a, a nuance to that. Uh, would be, for example, the acquisition of Mills College in Oakland okay. by uh, Northeastern university. Uh, we might say they're building a campus there. Really, they're incorporating, though they're somehow merging those two campuses, uh, whether that's successful or not. Um, but those models uh, may lead to some environmental benefits. In other words, there's less investment in, uh, in some aspects of the operation, energy investments in the operation. But uh, the, I think the questions of the off, uh, of the international campuses are more, um, uh, there are other issues that are more important than the environmental ones uh, there that have to do with cultural, cultural and political um, implications. And uh, the guest on the forum last week, uh, uh, President Gee from West Virginia, mm -hmm at a point of view on that, um, at least from his standpoint, that uh, those international campuses were, uh, uh, he didn't find them to be appropriate investments, but that was his, that was his view. Yeah, uh, it was. Roxanne, thank you for the great question. Uh, Michael, thank you for the, uh, for the excellent answer and the connection to our previous session. Um, we have uh, more questions that have come in, and I want to make sure that we get a chance to talk about them. Uh, from James Sullivan at Marywood University, where he is the Dean of Architecture. Mm. 
would you address adaptive reuse of existing buildings as a sustainable strategy, yet the challenge of changing older buildings to accommodate contemporary uses? What strategies are you seeing? Oh, James, what a great question. I, mm -hmm. You know, they, we don't have the opportunity to start from scratch. We have to start from where we are. And so that means that institutions have a host of buildings that were built for a different time and place. Um, and so the adaptive reuse of those buildings is extremely important. And it's also environmentally important because those buildings represent sequestered carbon. Just stop and think about that for a moment. Those buildings represent sequestered carbon. Every piece of steel and wood and brick and concrete and everything is sequestered carbon in one way or another. And as a result, thinking about taking those buildings down, rebuilding something else in its place is a huge carbon load. And so it makes a lot more environmental sense to reuse those buildings. It not only honors the place, but it honors the, um, uh, it honors, it's an environmentally appropriate uh, response. There are of course exceptions to that. Some buildings must, must go, there's no question about that. But the vast majority of the buildings on campuses right now that, um, um, that are there uh, will be there for a long time, and they will be um, uh, there. Um, I'm going to digress into another point. This gives me the opportunity to, to talk about something that uh, relates to the way I think about campuses and institutions. There is an unspoken part of every institution's mission to exist forever. Mm. It's never written down, mm -hmm. but it's there. The assumption is that institution will be there, in effect, forever. And I believe it's important for the people who are building those places, taking care of those places, to include that in their understanding of their responsibility. Mm -hmm. And from that perspective, Keeping those old buildings, reusing them, making them new is a way to be able to do that. It's not fancy like uh, building a new flashy building, but it is appropriate environmentally and it's consistent with their overall mention, uh, mission to be there for the long term. That's a, it's a huge point. Um, and that's where trustees and presidents often think. Indeed. Uh, thank you. That's a, that's a powerful digression. Um, uh, we also have uh, a question coming from Bob Hicks at Stantec. And he asks, it comes back to the curricular question from a, from a different angle, or uh, I think a very precise angle. Uh, should we modify the academic schedule to reflect seasonal energy requirements? For example, summer vacation seems particularly poorly timed for many schools. I, I guess by that he's referring to uh, uh, the abundant amount of solar power available. Yeah, Bob, thanks for, thanks for the question. Um, I think that relates back to or connects back to the question that we had from, uh, uh, from Kenyon uh, College earlier. I, Bob, I, I see the schedules becoming much more fluid. Uh, and and that may be that um, I'm not certain how that will happen, but I do see the schedules becoming much more fluid. It's um, if you talk with some current college students, it's not unusual for them to conceptualize the school year in a series of four and eight block time frames. Uh -huh. Uh, even some institutions that are organized in normal semester plus, uh, plus uh, summer uh, schedules. In other words, there's a lot of movement going on there. 
uh, at least at some institutions. And maybe I've been talking with folks who are going to the, I'll label it the Northeasterns, where, where yeah. geography, geography is malleable uh, and the schedules are malleable in the sense that the four and eight block uh, time schedules uh, matter. Um, but, but to return to your, the technical component, Bob, of your question, I think it's possible to, um, uh, to bridge those gaps in whether it's solar energy or wind with energy storage. And so I think technically energy storage on site will wind up being a large part of the way that campuses achieve uh, net zero uh, carbon and uh, are able to accommodate fluctuations in energy supply as a function of weather or uh, season. How do you think physically the, the, that will appear on campuses? I mean, do you think, for example, we'll have the campus energy storage building or, you know, there'll be the, uh, the underground storage facility, perhaps using sand, perhaps using salt, that'll be under another building or, uh, you know, or would that be a, a building for campuses to celebrate as a, a sign of their, of their greenness? Most of what I've just talked about is invisible, Brian. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It's invisible because it is not like a power plant and it doesn't have a steam, you know, it doesn't have a smokestack. Uh, the most dramatic example that I could give you would be um, a uh, ground source uh, uh, storage facility that <laughs> Princeton University has under construction. It'll take them 15 <clears throat> years to implement it, <clears throat> started it, and it's a series of uh, it's a series of wells uh, hmm. uh, that go into the ground. Um, they don't discharge water into the ground. It's a closed it's a closed system. But they're using the temperature of the um, uh, deep in the um, uh, deep below the surface. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now there's certainly above ground. There are you know pump houses and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, most of the kind of systemic issues that I'm talking about are uh, invisible on campus. Now, in order to make those schemes work, it is first necessary to decrease the demand for energy for every piece mm -hmm. that's there. Mm -hmm. And that's where the changes take place. In the desert southwest, those changes include shade structures mm -hmm. that are relatively large compared to the buildings so that the buildings themselves are shaded and protected from solar radiation. Now, that solar radiation, of course, can be those shade structures. Those can be solar panels. So that's an, exa that's an example of, of that. Thank you. I, I'm, I, I think that's, uh, I, I mean, it's like we're, we're getting a kind of Richard Scarry style view of a campus, right? You know, just going bit by bit, uh, pulling out everything. Um, one of the things that I love about uh, thinking this way is how much we get to learn about campuses. But one point of energy use comes up that Vanessa Vale just raised, and this is, this is a deep question. And I, I want to give you a chance to chew on this one for a bit. Um, Considering an inevitable move to online learning, increased online learning, what are the plans for green computing? I mean, computing uses a bunch of energy. Uh, yeah, Vanessa, that's a that's a tough question. It it does fall outside the meter that the institution has. You know, if you think about the institution it's got one electric meter and it's got one gas meter and it pays a whole series of it pays a whole series of bills that's why the campus is a unit that you can actually get your hands around and do something and demonstrate it it's not just that you're talking about it you can measure it uh, now the use of a student offsite her use of her computer offsite in her house 
as a as a green computing uh, uh, response is going to be dependent on a larger solution set, and that is the the decarbonization of the network itself. And at that point, you're talking about the state, the city, the county, the the nation's infrastructure being decarbonized in terms of the delivery of electricity. Now, why do I keep saying electricity again and again and again? That's because the for, that's the form of energy that does not have to be fossil fuel. And that's why a lot of institutions first step in decarbonizing new buildings is to make sure that they're 100% electric. I hope that's towards the answer that uh, Vanessa was looking for. I think it's towards an answer. And Vanessa, I hope you get to hear this at least in, uh, in the recording and hopefully live. Uh, Vanessa is coming on a very, very thin bandwidth pipe. But I guess if, if I could build on that, um, Michael, do, do, do you anticipate, for example, campuses using a lot more computing because they're using that to do virtualization of study abroad. They're doing it in order to reduce other travel, but also to reduce other carbon footprint issues. Uh, or do you see campuses using less computing? For example, uh, to pick an extreme example, banning Bitcoin mining, because that's incredibly intense, or perhaps reducing the amount of AI neural network training on large data sets, because that's also computationally intensive. Uh, perhaps campuses will use less in the way of cloud computing, more on site hosting. I mean, so I guess, do, do you see more or less computing in terms of green computing? I Hadn't really thought about that question until now, Brian. Uh, it seems to me that the that uh, I, I'm going to fall back to this. If that electricity that's being used for whatever purpose came from a carbon source, mm -hmm. that's the issue. Mm -hmm. If that electricity, all other things being equal, came from renewables in one way or another. And and once again, that's wind and solar, that's ground source heat pumps, that's wave action, uh, that's a whole variety of technologies that are available. If that's the source of that electricity, I see it as not mattering. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, diving inside that box, you get to the question of, when electricity is used for computing, it generates a great deal of heat. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so that creates an opportunity to recapture that energy so uh -huh. that it can be reused for other purposes, whether that's generating yet more energy, uh, electricity, or simply using it in heat form to heat water that's stored in such a way that it's later possible to be able to use as we would think of it as being stored in a battery. Great idea. Great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vanessa, thank you for that great question. As always, uh, we're great to, great to have you on board. Michael, we're almost out of time and we are fortunately just about out of questions, but I had one last one to ask you. Uh, we're talking about net zero and ways of reducing electrical use and, re and reducing um, uh, fossil fuel use. I'm wondering what kind of future you see for uh, carbon sequestration and capture on campuses. Do you think, uh, I, mean, I mean that if, if, you're, if you're new, everyone else, if you're new to that, this idea of sucking down carbon from the atmosphere and you can do it naturally, such as with forests, or you can do it with new technologies. Uh, Iceland has a big project for this right now. I'm just curious, do you think we'll see campuses covered with more uh, more trees for this purpose or mounting big DAC uh, units? Or do you think we'll think that's just not a contribution we're willing to make? I think the easy answer is yes on trees. I'm uncertain about uh, the large sequestration uh, projects. Uh, because from my perspective, we need to concentrate on things we can do now as mm -hmm. rapidly as we can do them. If other mm -hmm. things come along, 
uh, that's that's wonderful, and and in fact necessary given the pace which we uh, collectively are are moving. Uh, but on the question of on the question of trees, some campuses have farms that they uh -huh. have planted uh -huh. and are approaching previously and are approaching the point where those farms have captured as or at the growth they've grown as much as they can uh -huh. in other words they're reaching a peak sequestration point so their question is do we plant more trees someplace else et cetera et cetera so those those items uh those approaches like that albeit on small campuses are significant and meaningful and instructive it's a part of the mission of the institution to inform people about how to live on the planet and those actions and the subtlety of, oh, the, the forest can't store any more carbon. Mm -hmm. That's an important kind of understanding mm -hmm. as people move forward into the future to live on that planet that's different. In the, in the chat, oh, about half an hour ago, um, uh, Tim Michels or Michaels said that there are real opportunities that colleges can be the basis of future workforce development by addressing the pedagogical opportunities of training students in climate change responses. The campus becomes a laboratory that can leverage community solutions. Um, and if, uh, Brian, if I can add quickly to that. Yeah. On the uh, at the ASHI website, that's the Association mm -hmm. for Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. There, by every institution, there is a description of what they're doing in terms of their curricula, what kind of courses are being taught. In some places, you can pick up the syllabuses for those um, for those courses and uh, see the results of the of the student work on those topics. Fantastic, fantastic. What a great point. I'm afraid we have to pause right now, Michael, because we're at the top of the hour, but what a great point to end with real projects, real work, and looking at higher education as a way of helping students and others uh, try to adapt to a new world. Michael, what, what's, is campusmatters.net the best way to keep up with you and your work? It is, absolutely. Excellent. Well, I, I'm gonna say this again, thank you Thank you so much. You've just been a, a terrific guest. You've shown us so much, so much, and you've 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 taken us in a in a tour of where campus is going to physically be going. Where campus is going to physically be going. Thanks, Brian. Great to be with you. Oh, our pleasure. Well, don't go away, friends. Um, this has just been so important. Uh, I'm I'm so so glad uh, that we've been able to have this conversation. We're going to continue this with more. Um, and for those of you in the chat who would like to see more, please reach out to me. I'd, I'd like to do more. If you want to keep talking about this, um, you can right now go on Twitter and use the hashtag FTTE or tweet at me, Brian Alexander, or at Shindig Events. You can also jump up on my blog, brianalexander.org, because we've been talking about this for a while. If you'd like to look back into our previous sessions, either about uh, green and climate issues or about physical campuses, just head to tinyurl.com slash FTFarchive. Uh, looking ahead, we're going to be continuing on the climate crisis as well as on topics including free speech on campus, young adults and jobs, and the Paradigm Project. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to learn more. And if you want to share your own work, like Ed Webb is sharing the project at Dickinson or elsewhere, just ping me, brian.alexander at gmail.com. Once again, thank you all for your questions, for your thoughts. This has been a terrific discussion. I hope you're all doing well this summer. I hope you're all safe and working hard. Take care of yourselves. We'll see you next week online. Bye-bye.